All right, Smiley, uh, another huge week in the world of golf. Uh, both both of us traveling, playing, you watching and calling all the action at the U.S. Amateur. We are, of course, going to get to uh, what Victor Hovland and many are calling like the best round that they've ever seen. Victor Hovland saying it's the best round of his life, shooting a 61 to win the BMW Championship. We will get to that. But before we do... I'd love to hear a little bit about your week. You were in the booth. Uh, for those of you watching on our YouTube channel, which if you're not, you should go there now and subscribe and check it out. You're in a button down and you got a little, maybe a little product in your hair. I mean, it's a nice, it's a very professional look you got going here. So tell, tell me a little bit about, you know, your, your experience being in coat and tie in the booth for the USAM. Yep. Just got off the air. Cherry Hills for the USAM. Nick Dunlap got it done. Uh, been in a booth before, but I would call it more of a trailer. There was nothing on camera. So I've been in analyst type roles, but nothing to where we had on camera, uh, type set. So yeah, it was different, you know, like the, the lights come to you you're so bright. It's just, it's very odd <laughs> when you're, you know, your talk, like for instance, Dan Hicks was our play by play this week. who did an amazing job, but still, I've never had like a conversation where somebody's looking at you, but they have to look away to look at the audience to acknowledge the audience. And so um, it, the first time that happens, you're like, wow, that it's like he, I, I can't tell if he's ready for me to stop talking. So there was, <laughs> there was a bit of a learning curve and I got more comfortable every day uh, just with, with the on camera stuff. Um, and just kind of how the flow goes in the big chair uh, for NBC shows. And yeah, man, it was, it was fun. I really do love the analyst role. Uh, that I love being on the golf course a ton, but uh, definitely like to save the mileage on the feet uh, as much as I can. And this week, you know, with the college kids in there, just really the golf tournament itself, Cherry Hills, saw so much incredible golf. And mm. I feel like there wasn't a dull moment. There wasn't like a lull in the coverage where it just was like bad golf, like it seemed every match was, we found it to be interesting, or at least I did, um, as a golf junkie, but, but yeah, man, uh, 10 out of 10, great team, John Cook, John Wood, uh, our producer, Brant Packer was awesome. And, uh, probably the highlight of the week though, is Peyton Manning coming in to the set on Saturday. Um, he, you know, he's so easy to talk to and, but as he sat down, you know, I'd, I kind of got a piece of paper out and, you know, put it kind of right in front of him. And I kind of covered it so he couldn't see what I was writing. And this is probably 20 seconds before we're coming to our live shot of us. And I write out this little phrase and I, and I pointed over to him and, and I like, it's like, Hey, Peyton, check this out. And he looked at it and it said, gold tigers. <laughs> <laughs> that would have so, been the shortest odds you would have gotten in the entire world on that being the phrase that you pass across the table to Peyton. I love that so much. A little bit of sec banter. You, you love to see it. Yeah. You know, I just had to make sure he felt comfortable in front of the camera. Of course. You know? <laughs> of course. Well, I, I, I saw him, I, I didn't watch the full clip, but I saw him roasting you and John a little bit for wearing your LSU purple, which, you know, love it here. I, I guess I, I, uh, you're wearing somebody ended up in, yeah. in, yeah, I'm wearing a little volunteer orange. I'm not, I'm not really a Vols guy. I'm a Carolina guy as we know, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here to balance it out a little bit for Peyton. Um, I, I did see Dan Hicks giving you a little bit of, uh, uh, most improved award over the weekend for your, your headset position. This, and this is something I think it's, I don't know. I think it was maybe on one of your Instagram stories, but you can find the clips of the, the, the day one headset position was creeping. It was almost creeping into headband territory, which <laughs> I had an inkling. This might happen knowing that you're an earbuds guy on the podcast. So how, how do, how do, first of all, how does, how did the headset end up in that position? Were you aware that it was creeping that far forward? No, our, our first on camera, uh, we like everything was, everything was where it should have been. And they came to us kind of three fourths of the way through the coverage for another on camera. And apparently I like my headset to be on my forehead because it was comfortable there. And they didn't, our, our, uh, our booth manager guy named Greg, he didn't notice like Dan didn't even notice while he was talking to me, but apparently everybody, uh, from the producers, everybody in the truck, was just howling when they were looking at my my uh, my headset as it's like it just it's like holy crap did his did his hairline just recede an inch since the last time we've seen him or is his headset like over his eyeballs right now so it was a it was a tough scene and uh, 
and I as Dan Hicks said, most Easy improved. Yeah. I, I will never make that mistake again. <laughs> I love it. And it seems like the button downs, the, the little modified button downs held up as well. You know, yeah. we move that we move that top button over. Were you enough airflow circulation happening there? Were you, no, were you was, satisfied with with the with the the uh, what the tailoring that was done I to your was, shirts? I was so concerned about that uh, that I wasn't going to be able to breathe, especially if like our mm. booth was hot or warm. You know, just just like the the sweat you got from just being on TV, and then yeah, uh, it held up. And I even told Dan, I was like, you know what, I'm getting so comfortable in a coat and tie that I might just fly home on my red eye tonight in a coat and tie just because look I get you, you know, I just, you're, you're one of the fancy airplane people now. Like you no, always I'm look not. like you're ready to, <laughs> you're ready to go. I'm the guy over here where, I mean, we'll get this later in the show, but um, I, I can't believe I'm admitting this. Like I took a nap on the floor at LaGuardia this morning. Like I slept for a half hour on the floor at LaGuardia because it was the only, it was the only choice I had. I, it was either that or it would, it would have been a lot worse. Otherwise, I, I think I need to invest in we like had, one of those. Sky we had lounges. two different weekends. Um, we do. We have very different weekends. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no. The overall, the whole experience was great. I mean, shout out to my boy uh, Kellen, who's been cutting my hair. He got me some products. I'm yes. not a product guy, and he gave me some products. It's, it's a good like, look, man. I feel like it's working. Um, I think it's working. <laughs> Yeah. So, but yeah, it's it's a thing if you're a golf hat guy, you know, it's like it's you don't really always get a chance to to do some with the hair. So it's it's a nice little it's a nice little deal for you, man. It's yeah, yeah. Between that and then just like I feel like, um, you know, anytime it was like before any big dance in like middle school or junior high, and I, I would never wear product or anything then, but I always was really good about having a zit show up right around that time. You and me both, man. <laughs> and I had this kind of like forehead warrior that showed up yeah. uh, yesterday. Now I got makeup I'm putting on. It's just, I mean, I, I was a, you know, a, like a Barbie in the, in the damn booth this weekend. <laughs> I think I think we need to normalize makeup for teen boys because I was the exact same way. And there was there was actually one time where I was like, mom, like, can you help me out here? And and you know what? It, it was it was. Yeah, that that brings back some it brings back memories. I don't know that I call them good, but definitely memories. Uh, so you, you you talked a little bit about you know, Nick Dunlap's performance. He does something only Tiger Woods has done. You know, Tiger, of course, won three U.S. juniors in a row from 1991 to 1993, and then three U.S. amateurs in a row from 94 to 96. And so Nick is that won. Good? Like, is that, is that, is that good? 91 what, to 96. What is high score mean? Year? Is, is that good? Um, yeah. So, so Nick, uh, of course, you know, not exactly on Tiger's level, but still a really commendable thing. He, he won the junior am at, uh, CCNC, not far from where I am now in, in 2021. Uh, and then of course beat Neil Shipley four and three to win the amateur. Um, I'd love to hear, you know, you, he's an Alabama guy, so you know, Nick, well, uh, might end up on the show at some point soon. Um, but just your thoughts on the way Nick played and then you know, you, you kind of talked about it to open the show up of, of there weren't really any dull moments. There was always kind of, you know, exciting action, a good play this entire week. Were there players this week that were not on your radar prior to seeing them play in the USAM where you're like, oh, I want to I'm going to keep an eye out for that guy in the future. Yeah, there was a lot of guys uh, kid named John Marshall Butler made it to the semifinals. Actually, probably the storyline of the week was this guy named Paul Chang. Yes. Yeah. And he had a hole out on 16 against John Marshall, but really th- he took out, I felt like the best players in the field coming into it, I felt like were Gordon Sargent, Nick Dunlap, and Caleb Surratt. And Caleb Surratt won his first match, you know, going away. Match two, he gets faced up with a guy that nobody really has heard of, a guy named Paul Chang. He's played on the, he's from China, came over to the States, went to Virginia, joined the club golf team the last three years there. So he's playing club golf and his, asking the coach of Virginia to try to get onto the team. And finally this summer, I think going into this year, the Virginia coach was recruiting someone that also Paul Ching was in the group. And I guess maybe he's wearing his Virginia stuff. But anyways, the guy says, you know, we'll give you an opportunity to walk on this year because that's all the opportunity he wanted. So this kid qualifies, goes through stroke play, makes it to match play and hasn't been playing golf that long from what I've been told and goes up against who I think to be one of the best players in this field, Caleb Surratt and our producer, Brant Packer, Tennessee fan, um, and the head coach at Tennessee guy named Brennan Webb is caddying for Caleb Surratt. And apparently 
Brennan came up to Caleb and said, or Brennan came up to Packer, our producer, and said, this guy is unbelievable. And that really was just kind of like a huge surprise in the fact that, you know, Caleb losing to somebody, you would have felt like it would have been to somebody like a Nick Dunlap, like a Gordon mm-hmm. Sargent, like a Ben James, these these high profile players, because his his form, his quotes coming into it, you just didn't feel like he was going to lose, gets knocked out by uh, by Chang. And he he really was one of the best stories this week. But um, other guys, Ben James, uh, just mentioned him. He's a really yeah. solid player, uh, won five times as a freshman at Virginia. So he's going to be joining Chang <laughs> next year, next fall. But the North Carolina team is going to be really good next year. The Auburn team is going to be really good. Alabama as well. And uh, yeah, just it's really cool seeing these guys at a young age. There's also, I wouldn't say they they just there's no scar tissue yet there for a lot of these kids, mm. and they just they don't know what they don't know. And I felt like Nick Dunlap on the other hand of that he's the most mature of that entire bunch. I feel like he's had the most experience and he's just not afraid to go up to, for instance, this week, Peyton Manning said he came up to him at Castle Pines because the four Walker Cuppers were out there playing and Peyton was following along and, and Nick Dunlap is asking him how to handle pressure situations. It's, it's those type of questions to me that separate you know, how good does a player want to be just mentally just starting to ask the right questions. And Nick's got all the talent in the world. And I'm going to go for a little trivia question here for you. Okay. What do you think Nick Dunlap's match play record is over his last 32 matches? Oh, I mean, you, you got to assume it's good, right? I mean, I would, I would, I would guess maybe he's lost four times, 28 and four or something like that. He is 30 and two. Wow. 30 and two. And I'll tell you the, his matches. He lost, he lost to Caleb Surratt uh, last year in the U S junior semifinal match where both of those players, I was out there watching them really didn't have their a stuff. And Caleb ended up winning that match this year at the Western amateur. Nick Dunlap is facing a guy named Christian Moss from South Africa and uh, plays golf at Texas. They met in the quarterfinals. Nick is three up on him through five. Christian Moss birdies nine of his next 11 holes to beat him. So wow. that's the first time he's kind of gotten just ran into a hot Bus putter and on, gotten yeah. bird race. But I mean, dude, him and Jeff Curl, um, he's one of my good buddies back home. We played a bunch of golf with Jeff and Nick and Jeff's kind of been there every step of the way for Nick. And mm. I really think you can't underestimate how much that has helped him because Jeff has played, you know, countless tours. He's played golf his whole life. His dad was a tour pro, won uh, countless times on the PGA Tour. And I just think his mentorship for Nick has been so, so good for him because he's he's just a step ahead of, mm. it, of it seems like he's a pro in a 19-year-old body because of the way he thinks, just seeing golf shots, knowing how to play shots. And um, you credit Nick for the his hard work and his belief and his talent. But also, you got to kind of credit Jeff for just his um, mentorship towards Nick and and helping him along. So you say Nick even more so than Gordon Sargent. I mean, I I, I love that we got that matchup. I hate that it happened in the round of sixty four. Um, you know, and obviously that was kind of the, the maybe the the two biggest marquee names squaring off right away. And and I believe Nick won two and one there. But so you would say even. You know, Nick's level of experience. I mean, this is not to take anything away from Gordon Sargent, but that's saying a lot for a guy that, you know, Sargent's the number one amateur in the world, you know? Well, uh, I mean, I wouldn't really necessarily. uh, There are two different players, you know, like Mm -hmm. Gordon has, you know, I I compare him to more like a Cameron Young guy that just has superpowers. I mean, Cameron Young can hit it longer than anybody. He's got ball speed that's, you know, just up there with some of the longer players in the world. And and we we know what Gordon can do as far as ball speed goes. And I just think experience-wise, to me, you know, Gordon has only played in one or two PGA Tour events. He's still kind of learning his way for the pro game. Mm-hmm. And not to say, like, Nick Dunlap's only played two U.S. Opens and he missed the cut in both. And... I, I guess what I'm kind of my point is, and I'm not trying to compare the two by any sure, means, sure. Um, that I feel Nick's like just got a very good sense of maturity to his game. And I do think the same about Gordon. I just haven't watched Gordon play enough as well. So it's hard for me to to really compare the two. 
Yeah. Well, and that's more of a question from someone who isn't, you know, super familiar. You know, we watch the guys on tour week in, week out. We're trying to understand these guys better. And that's why a, a platform like this week helps us see the way they play the game and what they do really well. But that that helps kind of make the comparison a little bit of, of Nick's has sort of this this good feel and maturity beyond his years, you know, around the game. And that should serve him well long term. Whereas Gordon Sargent's a guy that just is, I mean, Every, we've had multiple people on the show marveling at his ball speed, Adam Scott included. He just, yeah, this guy is going to be a monster. So crazy. And two Walker Cup teammates. And and by the way, on the topic, uh, saw your boy Stu Haggis had out of detail this weekend. He said you two were texting. Wanted to want to say hello. Another Walker Cupper. That yeah. team was announced today. He's officially on that team. So uh, that'll be and that's at St Andrews. Uh, so uh, that'll be that'll be one to keep an eye on here in a few weeks. Um, so, so that's nice little recap of the USA. I'm glad to hear it was a good little analyst week for you there. Of course, we had to flip over to the BMW championship and what a sort of thrilling week it became. I mean, we had on Friday, Max Homo set the course record, uh, shot a 62, which a uh, previous course record was 63. Uh, then Sam Burns less than 24 hours later, shoots 62 to uh to tie max homo's course record and then victor hoblin goes out and shoots a 28 on the back nine uh and and a 61 to break the course record yet again all in the span of three days uh and and win the tournament uh going away i mean that he he made all threes and one four on the back nine and that one four was a birdie at the par 5 15th so uh it was the only I feel like bummer and the way that whole thing shook out was watching Scotty kind of falter down the stretch. Uh, he made par at the par five fifteenth, and he bogeyed the 17th and, you know, effectively needed to hole out from the fairway on 18 to force a playoff. Um, but the thing I loved about it was these two guys we talked about all year long is playing some of the, the best, most consistent high level golf of anyone on tour. Um, and that's no disrespect to a, a John Rahm or Roy McIlroy. But if you look at, all the tour pros who made all four cuts at the majors this year, Scotty and Victor one and two in scoring average and strokes gain without having won a major this year. And so I, I get it. This isn't a major level. This is uh, you know, this is a playoff event. You know, it, it's, it's, it's heightened to a certain extent, but to see those two guys kind of going at it down the stretch and seeing Victor win one, I, I'm just curious, you know, where you think that puts Victor heading into the season finale. I mean, he, I, I believe he's now, he is he is second in the FedEx yep. Cup, so he and Scotty will be in that final group. He'll start at eight under. Scotty will start at ten. Just your thoughts on the performance he put together this week? Well, I can be honest with you and say I didn't get to watch one single shot of the BMW <laughs> Championship. We had a very long week of five days of coverage, and uh, my I didn't get Golf Channel in my room either, so I wasn't really in the mood to stream um, any golf this weekend. And I uh, didn't get to watch any of the coverage over the weekend being in our same window, but just sitting here kind of looking at the stats and seeing where these guys finished up and, you know, just that, that top 30 bubble as well was very interesting. Mm -hmm. I kept kind of checking that out throughout the day as well. Cause Jordan was right on that line at SEP and they both kind of squeaked in. So it was good to see those two guys make it to East Lake. But to your point with Victor, you know, I've been high on him the entire year it's not surprising to me to see him get a victory. I don't know anything about this golf course or how it played, but it seemed like to me the scoring was, you know, fairly consistent as far as just the weather went. It seemed like they got a pretty good weather week. It wasn't crazy soft, a little bouncy and um, some wind at times. But, man, it, it kind of just turns my head to, you know, what we potentially might see. I feel like the everybody just kind of wants to get through the tour championship. It feels mm -hmm. like at this point and just like, we just want to know who's going to be on the Ryder cup team. And yeah, yeah. I don't know if we had anything answered this week, but I think one of the big headlines is the fact that Brooks Kepka inched his way out of the top six standings of the Ryder cup. So in that case, when you hear the interview that uh, Colton drew did with Zach talking, Zach speaking about how, you know, I haven't had any communication with any of the live guys. It's hard for me to go watch them play. But he also gushes about at the same time how, you know, Brooks Kepka is a big time hunter in a in big time events. So you have to feel like that's a compliment to a guy who you expect to be on the team and a pick. But, you know, the golf world, regardless of which side of the fence you stand on, whether you're pro PGA Tour, pro live golf, pro both. If no live player is selected on 
the United States team, it's going to be an uproar. And yeah. whether that's right or wrong, um, I, I do think Brooks Kepka should be on the team. I don't really have an opinion outside of, of any other player that I feel like should be on the team. Um, but still, you know, it's, it's like, we've been talking about every single episode. It just seems like, I don't know who the heck's going to be on the scene. Yeah. Well, I mean, that that's, it's funny. I mean, we had this further down the rundown to kind of close out the show, but you know, it's, it's the thing that's on our minds constantly. I feel like every conversation I've had about golf, you know, in the last few weeks inevitably turns back toward who's going to be on that Ryder cup team. Cause it's such an interesting selection dilemma that Zach Johnson has this year. That's a lot different from things we've seen in years past, or even, you know, the selection for the the European team, the, the kind of picture that Luke Donald has to paint. But yeah, I mean, you, you kind of noted it there. I mean, Brooks entered the week. He was fifth with 9,421 points. Max Homa was sixth. And Xander Shopley was seventh. Max earned 790 points this week, and Xander earned 620 points this week to just barely edge ahead of Brooks in that sort of qualifying structure. And this, yeah. of course, is the last week where the guys could earn points toward the Ryder Cup qualification process. It ends now. Zach will announce his team after the tour championship. But this is this is it. The tops, the guys that qualified automatically for, for the team USA are Scotty Scheffler, Wyndham Clark, Patrick Cantley, Brian Harmon. Max Homa and Xander Shoffley. So it, it, it's a, it's a very interesting dilemma. And, and I, I agree. I think at the end of the day, if it was going to be a live guy, like, I think we're having a very different conversation now, if that's Bryson DeChambeau's name and not Brooks Kepka's, because I think Brooks, you know, as we've discussed, it is fairly well liked on the PGA tour still. And there are even rumors going back a couple of months that he felt like he made a mistake you know, going to live instead of staying on tour. And then maybe some of that was influenced by the state of his knee injury at the time. And now that he's back playing good golf, winning majors in contention at other majors that, you know, it's healed to the point where maybe he wished he would have stayed um, still playing practice rounds with guys like Rory McIlroy and others. So like that, I, I think that there is a good chance that he still gets a pick because of his track record and big events. And because he will fit in that team room as Zach Johnson has referenced so many times you know, if you're posing it to the players, you know, those guys, you know, might, you know, say, yeah, this, this is something we're comfortable playing with. But I think it gets really, really complicated when the 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 rest of the names you're looking at on that, you know, it's not so much a short list as a long list. But I mean, it, it's Brooks, it's Jordan Spieth, Colin Morikawa, Cam Young, Keegan Bradley, Sam Burns, Ricky Fowler. Justin Thomas, Denny McCarthy, Lucas Glover. And then you could even throw in if you want, if you want to be charitable to that live crowd, Bryson DeChambeau, Dustin Johnson, and Taylor Gooch. I mean, that, and for six spots. So, I mean, I, do, do you, so you still think Brooks gets the pick? Yeah. Yes, I do. And as far as being like a big team room guy, I wouldn't necessarily put Brooks Kepka in that category. He's always oh, interesting. Me, felt like a lone wolf, uh, just as far as his preparation. And you, he's a good team team guy. And the fact that you throw him out there and you know that he's probably, he's going to give it all you got. And he is going to uh, be arguably the most talented player that can handle big moments. And I mean, you just think about some of the drama we talked about, you know, Brooks has gotten into a deal with Bryson. He got into a deal with Patrick Cantlay, complaining about his slow play. Cantlay is going to be on that team. Mm. Does he get along with everybody? I'm sure he does, but like, you know, there's always when guys, verbally talk to the media about not being getting along with somebody that always is going to be a little awkward. And the fact it's like, it'd be nice if Zach Johnson can have 12 guys on his team and say, everybody gets along. Um, you could pair them with anybody, but like you can already put on your list that can't lay and uh, can't lay and Kepka will never play together or even be close in the same pod. But we already know Xander Shoffley is Patrick Canley's partner, right. but, but just in that scenario, but uh you know, kind of to your point of all those guys for, for six spots. Yeah. It's, it's really tough. I think um, Cameron Young had opportunities this year to really, you know, just kind of creep over that line of like, Hey, I'm the most talented guy on your board, but also I haven't necessarily, I haven't won yet. I've uh, not had the best year, you know, just kind of a bit of a sophomore slump for a guy who we had such high expectations for coming into the year. And then you have that other crowd of guys who've had really successful years talking about Keegan Bradley, talking about Ricky Fowler, 
and talking about Lucas Glover. Like those are the three guys this year, 2023 that have earned, like played well enough to be a pick, but Cameron Young's going to be in that same category of Justin Thomas of, you know, did they necessarily earn it this year? Or are we just going to go off of what we think they, they can do to their potential? So of that group of guys, I don't know if you just go based off course statistics, you know, who fits better at this course, who pairs better with guys. But I think in my head, that's what Zach Johnson has to be thinking because when you have this big of a group of player, you can't just say, well, oh, he played well this week. Oh, this guy, you know, he putted really well that week. I think you just have to get, you have to dive into the statistics. You got to dive into who plays better with who and try to just get the best team that can go win in Europe because the conversation that we're having is so important because we haven't won in Europe. And that's yeah. why, yeah. and that's why it's such a big deal. Why if JT doesn't get picked and you go over there and lose, that's yeah. going to be a huge part of the conversation. It's like you left Kobe Bryant here at home. Yeah. And increasingly, I think that, I, I just really don't see how JT doesn't get a pick for all those reasons you discussed, you know, things, you know, just, it, it would be a lot different if any of those guys that were ahead of him on the points list had just been, you know, crushing it the past few months. And just, I mean, the, really the only guy that you can say that has kind of done that is Lucas Glover and, you know, and, and it's not the point points list matters anymore because the six guys are qualified are in and now it's all captain's picks anyway, but you know, he's further behind JT on points. Didn't play in any of the majors this year. He had, you know, a, another solid week this week. I mean, it's, you, you know, it'd be hard to ask him to go out and win a third tournament in a row, but you wanted to kind of see something, you know, to, that was saying, Hey, this is, this wasn't just sort of a flash in the pan these last few weeks. Like I'm, I'm one of the hottest golfers in the game right now. And so to leave me at home would be a pretty glaring omission. Um, I'll be curious to see how Lucas plays next week at East Lake. But I just think that, that the rest of that list, you know, yeah, Cam Young didn't do a ton to convince, you know, it, it, this, this year in its entirety. Um, I think if you look at some of those guys that down the stretch that really could have, you know, submitted their spot on the team, you know, like a, a Keegan Bradley, you know, even if you, I mean, really any of those names on that list, I, I just think that there, that, that there wasn't enough there to be like, yes, we absolutely have to rule JT out from being on the team because we, it'll be a, a crime to leave these other guys at home. And so I, I think you start looking at, you know, to your point, what teams are we going to put together that are going to help us you know, win on European soil and really looking at the kind of team dynamic side of things. I think Sam Burns playing well this week helped him help him out a ton you know, in terms of where he fits in that picture, especially as a guy that can pair with Scotty. Um, and I'll just be curious to see how the rest of that picture comes together uh, because it's, yeah, they're, they're just no, it, it's, it's like, you know, do you do JT and Jordan? I had Burns um, finishing up at a six under. Is that right? I thought he finished 15th. Uh, yes. Are you, are you, uh, you're, are you, you're not talking about router cut points, right? You're talking about this week. At the well, BMW. you just said like Burns had a really good, I just, I thought he, do you, I mean, am I missing something like Burns finish? Um, yeah, well, I, I would just say more of that. I mean, yeah, he shot 71, 70, 62, 71. So, okay, so he had one good round. So maybe, maybe that that's a little bit of an overstatement to say he had a great week. Uh, but I, just more more of like he's a guy that can heat up, um, you know, and in the right format, you know, if he's playing with Scott, you know, maybe that's, that's a guy that you want to take. He, he's kind of been the guy that hasn't been talked about hardly yeah. at all in this group. He's kind of the guy that seems... Like there's no momentum for him right now on, yeah. on Twitter, <laughs> whether there's momentum for him to get picked by the captains. I don't know, but it seems like there's more conversation on the hot player like Lucas Glover and just JT. It seems like that's like been the big argument. It's like, oh, you have to take Lucas Glover because he's playing better than anybody in the world. Well, I, yes, he is. But he also is playing he played really well on what I would consider. If you told me what golf courses would you pick for Lucas Glover to win at? Mm. I would pick Wyndham Championship. I would pick Memphis. Those are perfect golf courses for him. So yeah. I don't know if this golf course in Rome fits his game the best. I, I really do not know. The comp I read knowing up said um, would have been closer to Bay Hill. I, I got to see it from my own eyes. I just know elevations of play. So it's the hot player versus JT right now. And then it's kind of everybody else mushed together. Yep. And that's kind of what we're dealing with. Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting. And uh, and we will know in, in just about a week uh, after the tour championship. Can't wait. So, Can we do live on YouTube? Can we do like a oh, live thing? Yes, we should. 
Okay. We can and we should if we can make that happen. I don't know or, how YouTube or, works. Is that yeah. can you just like press a button and and then yeah. we're, we're live? Theoretically, <laughs> we're live, yeah, coming in could. live from the club club <laughs> pro center. <laughs> no, is it club pro center? Is that it? Uh, uh, the, the club pro guy live. learning centers are. Uh, oh, coming in live from the learning center. That's what it is. <laughs> That's <laughs> <laughs> so we we need a we need a. a, a Club Pro guys, a title sponsor on the podcast for our <laughs> live great. YouTube uh, episodes. Great. I've been on been on his podcast right when he got started, and it it just it's like amazing. wait, you're a normal dude. Like, can you not do your shtick? Like when we're talking, like oh, did the- he not do the shtick when he was interviewing you? I mean, like he had shtick questions, but like before we got on, we're just talking about the oh, interview yeah, and this yeah. and that, and he like wasn't talking in his normal like yeah yeah <laughs> i was just like hold it, on it, you can't be a normal person <laughs> it's like it's like the, the manolo the manolo teaches golf guy same yeah. deal like he has you like a whole separate accent you're like no 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 you don't you have to do this all the time now this is this is your your entire life um yeah, so what i want to come back to just in that group is cam young finishes 42nd in the in the fedex cup standings which yep. is it's not a it's not a terrible season he's in all the signature events next year mm-hmm. um but i guess against the expectations that maybe we had coming in what sort of a grade do you put on this season for cam young and like where do you what do you think he needs to work on the most going into next season and, and, and is some of that you know just kind of feeling out that partnership with paul tesori they they linked up at the match play i think that was the first time they were together and just fi- working that sort of relationship out well, I think he got better as the year went on. I think he was searching a little bit kind of in the middle of the year. He was working on golf swing stuff. Like I it just to me, like Cameron Young is is better when he's in that DJ mode where it looks like he's just not thinking about anything. And at times this year, you know, whether it was the changing of the caddy or just kind of going through a putting spurt where it looked like he was thinking. And then golf swing mm-hmm. gets a little off and now he's working on stuff with his golf swing and and it's for him. It's like simple is always better. And when he's thinking about less things and just playing golf shots, it, the talent just comes out and it's, it's, it's absurd how talented this kid is. And as far as what he needs to work on, you know, I th- he just probably needs to always continue to get better with the putter and mm. just getting better around the greens and just wedge play. But man, what he's able to do with the driver and just long irons and how good he he, he can just make golf course play, sh- you know, play so short. And I have no doubt about the Paul Tesori partnership. I think Tesori is one of the best caddies out there. And um, I think he's a very good balance for Cam in the fact that, you know, he can, you know, whether he has nerves he deals with as far as closing golf tournaments, Paul Tesori is very good with verbal communication and making sure a guy's completely comfortable with the decision you know, which is, you know, to win golf tournaments, you can't take shots off. And uh, I think, I think Paul is, is really a great asset to that team, but yeah, I mean, how I would grade his year. I mean, it's gotta be somewhere around a, it can't be a C, right. It's gotta be a B minus, you know, yeah. C plus maybe, I don't know. Maybe C plus B minus. Yeah. I mean, it's tough because, because I, I I think like anytime you're, you're making it in, in the top 50, Given the the criteria that are important for today's tour, you know, it's it, to your point. It can't be a C. It's got to be like C is like you know your C yeah, minus C, is like your seventies B player. minus. Uh, it's probably but I think just just for his expectations, I'd say maybe yeah. you know. Yeah, I know. I know his expectations are high for himself, and our expectations for him are high. And maybe that's all it is: is just changing expectations for him. Just allow yourself to go play good golf and not try try to put so much. Uh, pressure on yourself to whether it's get that big win or make the Ryder Cup team, you know, that that can weigh on a player, you know, when that's all anybody talks about when the TV comes on. It's like, well, Cameron Young's in contention, hasn't gotten his first pro win yet. You know, those, those can weigh on you, for, especially for a guy who's as talented as he is. Uh, on the topic of putting, I want to hit you with a few there because. Uh, you know, you're looking at like the strokes gained at the BMW championship this week. This is a tweet, uh, the fried egg put out right after the tournament. Um, Scotty led the field strokes gain off the tee. Uh, Victor Hovland was, was he, he gained, uh, about just less than five and a half, uh, strokes off the tee. Victor was 4.73. Uh, Scotty led in strokes gain approach, uh, eight shots. Victor was fourth in strokes gain approach, 4.34. Uh, Victor was fourth in strokes gain putting 6.18. Scotty was 38th. He lost almost two shots to the field in putting. Um, 
I'm not curious. My, not my Scotty. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's because I, I, part of this well, is, is we're going to debate part. like like this is a surprise. It's the same. No, 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 it's no, the no, same no, no, round no. he's put together no, every, he, he, every it's, time this year. It's, 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 he had a hot putter on Saturday, and it was, everybody's like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> he's been, uh, but well, looking at. I, I'm curious mainly because of the equipment switches that we saw him make and we saw Rory make. And Rory actually, uh, looking at his stats right now, he was he was he had positive strokes game putting. He was 22nd in the field, just less than a shot. I um, well. he, he had a couple of, of neg. I think I think he he lost shots of the field uh, on Friday and Saturday. That's, that's around the green, not approach. He was first around the green, so good up and down week. Yeah, yeah, we we saw that 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 uh, big up that uh, chippy hold out on on. Uh, Thursday, it was incredible. You but, saw, uh, but oh, uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and and even <laughs> then, I I barely saw. Uh, given given the rest of the weekend, but like you know, I think for Rory, he had he had a a, a very makeable eagle putt that would have kind of thrown him in the mix with with Scotty and Vic and 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 Fitzpatrick. Um, that he just it was it was a, sort of a downhill right to left or just didn't play enough break and just looked stunned. You know whether it was a read or the way he hit it. You know looking at it after the fact, he still makes birdie there. But I I, I wonder if Rory's uh, relationship, the sort of dalliance with this with the Scotty uh, Phantom X putter, will continue into this next week. Um, and I wonder the same for Scotty. It seems like, okay, the, the stats are telling you it's still bad, but has he found something he's a little more comfortable with that, with that spider? And can he kind of build on that going forward, putt a little better? So he did make some good putts there. And, 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 you know, as an addendum to that is like, can you just not make a putter change at this point? Like you're headed in the tour championship. Are you kind of just like, this is what I've been putting with for the last two weeks. And this is what I'm going to roll with. Well, from, you know, just when we're talking about Rory McIlroy's putting and Scotty Shelfer's putting, I would say I've been advocating for something different for Scotty Scheffler to look at for quite some time now. I just really, you know, when you get something different to the eye, now you're, you just need to start putting rounds together and continue to build a little bit of trust and just get a little bit more feel with this putter. You know, he had a great round on Saturday with the putter. So just getting some confidence, seeing the ball drop in the hole is all a guy needs that typically is right up the top with a strokes gain approach in, in uh T to green game. Um, when it comes to Roy McIlroy's putting, I don't necessarily see the putter as being a big difference hmm. maker for him. I started noticing some just technical things with Rory's putting. And it started to me at the Scottish open and he hit it so well. I really felt like he could have won that golf tournament by like eight shots at the Scottish Open. That's how well he was hitting it. And do you remember the old putting stroke of Rory McIlroy when he used to work with John Stockton and that butt of the club in his hands would go way forward It and just picture how the butt of the club wouldn't return back to, let's say, where it started at address. So right underneath your or just your left ear and I've I've been kind of noticing that he's had a lot of misses with the putter to the left, a lot of pulls. And to me, as I watch, he's not releasing the blade quite as good as he was earlier in the year. And it's really difficult to you know, have any trust when you're it's the worst thing in the world when you're hitting pulls like with a putter. And you know that like when you're hitting a lot of pulls, it's the worst. And the last thing you want to have to do is feel like you have to release the putter. So why would I want to, you know, release the putter when I'm already missing it left? Well, the, that's his pull miss is from hitting it in the heel. And then that putter just going too much down the line. So getting it more back on an arc, having it return back to square. I think that's the technical adjustment. Now, does he do that every time? No, but that is his tendency to me with his technique and his putting. I've seen him at times, uh, for the most part, you know, of last year, I've really noticed that he hasn't had as much of that down the line finish and hold kind of like how he used to have. But, you know, I really do think that that would be the technical adjustment for him. And I don't really necessarily see the putter as like just a make or break for him. It's it's can he feel comfortable releasing the putter that he has in his hands? And if he can do that, um, he's, I think, a good green reader and and puts it pretty well um, when he gets it going. 
that's interesting yeah this is like a nice little as you're as you're mentioning all this for rory i'm like wait yeah that's that's the thing that i do that's uh that- <laughs> did you putt? how'd you putt yeah. this weekend uh mm, like not not it, it was kind of like a middling performance it, it wasn't it, it, uh i give it like a like a c plus b minus it was actually funny as as i um as we were drifted further out of contention and I drifted uh, further into the south sides that I was consuming all, all day long. Those things are um, okay. I think they're a little overrated, but um, you know what? I, I, it's not like I, it's 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 a, a couple. I'll say it this way: a few years ago was like the rise of the transfusion, and everyone just it's, it's fell in love with the transfusion. Just <laughs> like you know, every golf course went from not serving transfusions to like they had you know they had a frozen one. They had this now they got it on merchandise in the pro yeah. shop. <laughs> uh, it's like you know, it's yeah, it's like it's like on, on every hat. I mean, Lord knows, like you know, our our club here in Durham, same thing. It's like transfusions aren't a signature drink, and now we have a, a hat that has a transfusion and with our club logo. It doesn't make any sense. Anyway, <laughs> that's all my way of saying. Like I, I like a good transfusion, but I think sometimes we like like I, I did what I what I like doing more of is. I go to a place and just serve me the signature thing that you guys are drinking here. Like I'll, I'll go outside my comfort zone, do something different and unique, but just serve me the thing that all the members like to drink. And at deep Dale, that is a South side. So I it said, sounds you know like what? you don't care how you get your buzz just as long, you know, you just want to be the guy that fits in and does, you know, shakes exactly. all the, the right hands and kisses the right babies. I get it. I get it. You know, it's, it's just, you know, what, what's he having? I'll have one of those, you know, like, I'm not going to be the guy that's like, I want like a dry martini, like people looking at me <laughs> weird at the bar, like, no, just, you know, I'll just have whatever everyone, everyone else is having. So it, that's, yeah, I had quite a few of those and my caddy actually, I had a couple bad misses early on and then I started just making a bunch of stuff at the end of the day. He's like, dude, you're releasing a putter is so much better. And I, and I was like, that's interesting because I, I have like that. I'm scared to death of pulling putts. Yeah, that's and, that's what and, Tiger always used to talk about is releasing the blade, man. Yeah, and then I, and then I just got all these these just disgusting push misses that are like <laughs> short right, and I'm like, this is the most aggravating thing in the world. Like, Dude, I, and you're, then, you're gonna continue missing it short right, like with your technique you got going on. We're gonna we, we got an off season. We'll, work we'll on fix it. it. We'll fix it. But th- to get it back on track here a little bit with with Rory, like I, I wonder how do you solve if you can see it. And you know that it doesn't matter what putter he has in his hands, whether it's the spider that he's used for so many years, the Scotty blade he went back to around the Masters, this most recent iteration of the Scotty, this Phantom Max with the wings on the back. You know, like, do, do any, I, I, the question I'd ask you is this, do any of those help him solve the issue you've identified in terms of not releasing the putter and just the way no. his stroke is changed. None of them do. So no, it doesn't it, matter. It doesn't matter. It, 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 so how, it so how, how, how do you how do you fix that then? Who in his camp is responsible for saying, Rory, we got to go work on you know putting mechanics instead of just keep keep on switching putters? Like like I, I guess to take that a step further is like, is it just a confidence thing where it's like he's either going to do it well or he's not? But in his own brain, if he has a different putter in his hand, maybe he thinks about it differently. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I it, it's, that's a little bit of a perception thing. I'll, I'll just simplify yeah. it for you. So with putting, either you can get your ball started on your intended line or you can't. If you cannot get your ball started on your intended line, it makes green reading that much more difficult. So let's say you have left or right putts and you you get over the ball and you're looking at your line that you put down and Rory doesn't use a line. Let's, let's just say you do. Um, just for this argument and you put that line down on the ball and you get behind it and you know exactly that line is going in the middle of the hole as far as just like this is how i make a left or right putt from eight feet it's a cup out this should be perfect you get over the ball and you're thinking there's no way in hell that if i put my line behind this you know lining up dead square i can make it with with this setup or just whatever something doesn't feel right and that's what happens with players all the time is is something technically gets off that starts affecting their green reading. And for Rory, I feel like that's kind of what led into his doubts with his green reading mm. is that technically he got off where he feels like I don't can't really trust about getting it started on my start line. Now you're like, do I play more break? Do I play less break? And just your overall consistency with the putter is not going to be quite as good day to day. That's really interesting. And and on the topic of lines like alignment aids on the ball. Do, do you recommend one way or another, like if you're having an issue where you're technically 
They're like, you know, in, in my case, I'm not releasing the putter. You know, same you, do thing not, you do not need to be using a line at all. That, well, well, I'm curious, like just for amateurs listening to the podcast, it's like, are, like, do, are people kind of getting themselves in more of a mental pretzel and they're having putting struggles by being so married to an alignment aid? Because kind of to your point, it migrates into the green reading. Now you're, you're, you're like, I, either I'm not reading these things right, or I, I'm, I'm seeing every putt in a different way now, because if I line it up here and it ends up right of the hole and, and in my mind, it's, well, I didn't, I didn't read enough break there. You know, but but in reality, it's no. You just you're pushing every putt. You know, it it like it, it. Where at what point in time, if you're having these sort of issues in your amateur player, like you probably just don't ever want to use an alignment aid at all until you get those sort of technical things corrected, right? Yeah, it's like a for instance, um, a an amateur with a golf swing that's not technically anywhere close, but he knows where it's going. So yeah, let's say he gets on the tee box, and all this guy does is play slices and he all he does is play slices it wouldn't be good to put alignment sticks down on a guy on the first tee box and he's like all right this is square and then he sets up to it and he's like holy crap like that line looks way to the right i normally hit a slice right down the middle of the fairway that would be the same type of situation for somebody with the putter that Mm. just is not technically sound they can't really get the ball started on line and when we see guys have that end over end roll with with using the line it's because all of their you know their setup everything is matched up they have the correct plane with their putter they have the correct um club path they're able to strike it correctly to where you know it doesn't get a crazy you know you're not hitting down on you're not hitting too far up on it so you're getting the right roll you know i really like using a line inside of 10 feet it allows me to be super specific but i'll use a line as well on longer putts but it's just as a more of a reference point hmm. and just for anybody that's kind of trying to figure out their putting or just using a line, not using a line. How do I get better? The best way to get started is to learn how, you know, get a chalk line, go to your home Depot, put mm-hmm. it in the middle of the hole, draw it back and just put eight footers using the line, trying to figure out, all right, where am I off in my setup to where I can start using a line more often because I do think it is an advantage to be able to use something to help you aim. And now other guys like, like Rory, I think a line isn't good for him because when he uses a line, it it puts more doubt in his head as far as when he gets over it, if he's not comfortable that he's like, you know what, I'm just going to be able to adjust to what my eyes see and not have to worry about so much about my technique, which works, you know, for the most part. But when you have those weeks where you're not, winning golf tournaments and it comes down to two to four shots and we just watch Rory miss or, you know, Rory or Scotty, whoever miss putts inside of 10 feet, or like this guy, it just, if he just made some more putts there that they would be winning more often, that's where that cons- level of consistency comes in. And I'm not saying that Rory and Scotty can't get their ball started on line and, and, and be able to hit their, their start lines. But, you know, you have to wonder what, what gets off for those two guys. Mm-hmm. And, to me, that's those are the main uh, kind of factors that I see. It's interesting. I mean, we t- there have been there was a lot in golf in today's day and age. You know, in terms of alignment aids and green reading techniques and and the, the aim line. points. Of, I I I'm like over it. I'm over watching I'm, guys <laughs> use aim point. Is it a great system? Yes, but I'm over watching guys stomp around and hold their fingers up there. It takes too long. Does it help? Yes. I'm just over watching people do it. I'm glad it helps people. It's just I just I'm tired of watching it. <laughs> I'm so with you there. It's like, I, I get it. They're playing for lots of money. They they need to have whatever competitive advantage that they can muster up, but it's just not good TV. It's, it's like, you know, like the pitch clock in baseball. Like I get it. You can maybe it's, throw a better pitch. If you have more time to think about location uh, and stuff yeah. or you know, get a better chance of getting hit, if you can step in out of the box, but like we, we, we can't be watching this. Like just, if you, just like if you're not a golf fan and you turn on golf and you just oh. watch like a guy hold up four fingers and, and if I tried to explain to you what they were talking about, like, what are they doing? You'd be like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah aim point. That's where you we know? are in green reading right now. <laughs> you go out and you get a grade and you figure out how many degrees of slope there is. You're like, all right, you lost me. I'm, I'm out. <laughs> well, um, yes. you know, they don't use like, for instance, we when I was playing on tour, they had green reading books where yep. they showed you the percentage of the slopes and guys would mark exactly where the pin is. And I don't know why I didn't use it every week because I just... I I was such an old school guy. I always I didn't ever believe in greens books. I think it's such a natural part of the game yep. that nobody should get the 
the answers to the test. Like you should be able, like, this is a skill. You shouldn't be able to have that, but all of these players still have their old, all these caddies have all of the old greens books and they'll mark it, you know, the night before when they get the pinhole locations and they just memorize in their head what the slope is. So all these aim point guys, they just use in their head, like they're all right pins here and they just memorize the slope. So they just know when they get there that they have a reference point of just the amount of slope. You're not supposed to write any notes in your garbage book, but there's nothing against like not memorizing what, what the situation is the next day. That's that's interesting. Uh, I, I will say on the topic, one of my favorite recurring bits on Twitter this year has been uh, Michael Kim uh, going out to practice putting greens and taking a level and setting it down next to where someone's written an incorrect number and being like, "Ooh, I hope this guy's uh, aim point is not miscalibrated this week because uh, this is a lot different than what it actually is." Um, but yeah, that's that's a that's an interesting one. Um, I have one more for you, kind of on the season in review topic, uh, and I know we'll have we have the tour championship uh, left. W- one one quick thing on just sure, a recap. Sure. One last, uh, I, I did want to forget um, forget this, but Matthew Fitzpatrick wanted to just have a quick yeah. comment on him mm-hmm. on the BMW. He has not been in form to me. Like I've been watching him out there. He's been off, you know, it's not the same Matthew Fitzpatrick. We saw at the U S open last year that we said, this guy is going to be an absolute killer at the Ryder cup. Like he's going to be a problem. I, he's been a little off this year at times, just seems like he had injuries early in the year with his neck, the neck. Just, yeah. Yeah. And then just kind of like was going through the motions, not really getting anything going this year. It was good to see, I mean, not good for the U S team, but like good to see him back playing well again this week. Um, looking at his numbers, it was really ball striking to me. He's had a lot of left misses, a lot of hooks off the tee and he was ninth in uh strokes gain T to green. So definitely, um, good to see strides from Fitzy. Uh, he's obviously a super talented player and, and I feel like that didn't need to go unnoticed him finishing T two. Oh, absolutely. I, I think it's interesting. The story of his entire year kind of to your point of struggling to perform at times, um, you know, n- not, not, you know, not a ton of like high finishes outside of the win at the Wait, RBC. He finished Heritage. 10th? Is he's 10th in the FedEx cup. <laughs> yes. He's 10th. Dude, in, the FedEx like, I, in my head. Oh, he, he was 40th though. He, that's, he, yeah, he went yeah, from 40th to 10th. Okay. In my head, I was like, yeah. wait, there's no chance this guy has been a top 10 FedEx cup player this year. So that, that makes way more sense that he jumped 30 spots. But I, I think his entire year, it, to me, it, it's honestly so impressive because, you know, guys dealing with injuries like that. And listen, as someone who's like, again, I'm not playing at this level, but I'm going to get spinal surgery in two months. And I've had just a, a thing in my neck for almost two years now. And it just drives you nuts. At a certain point, you're like, do I change the way I'm swinging? Do I just kind of figure out to, a way to deal with chronic pain? Like, I can imagine that multiplied by a thousand for someone who's competing on the highest stage in the game of golf and dealing with something that's nagging and, and probably chronic at points and still being able to go out and shoot a score and win an event like he did at the RBC Heritage. That was and, a heck and, of a tournament. That would have win. I mean, his putting that week was a joke. Oh, so and and especially cool because that's a place he loves so much. Yeah. Um. But I I think I think it's it's you know kind of to the point you're making there of like it, it's worth noting you know what he did this week and the, and whether or not he's actually in full and form. Like I think he was frustrated with a couple of shots he hit today that just you know not his usual self still, but still managing to go out and shoot a score and finishing tied for second. I mean that's yeah that's really impressive stuff. Really well, impressive that's, stuff. He's a guy if his ball striking is uh above average for him, he's gonna be a tough person to you know, he's gonna pair as well with anybody on the yeah. uh, European team and when you talk about Ryder cups, you it's only three days, you know, I think people yeah. forget about the president's cup. How that's four days. It makes a difference. You know, it's a, it's a little less golf. Um, but with Fitzy, he is such a good putter. Holy crap, man, mm. such a good putter. And that's what Ryder cups are all about is having guys that can make putts and, and keep that momentum and keep the crowd going. And Fitzy, he like falls right into that category. He actually, I don't know if you saw this. Well, you probably didn't see it at the end of the broadcast, but he had a putt for birdie on 18. If he would have made it, would have flipped Victor and Scotty at the top of the FedEx Cup points uh-huh. going into the last event. So Victor would have started shot, 10 under, yeah. Scotty would have started eight. So that's that's something. It's interesting. Um, um, oh, and just real quick. Uh, sure. Also, you know, I, I know you watched the entire coverage of the BMW and that's what you're <laughs> supposed to do because we had to have somebody do that. But shame on you. You know, shame on you for not watching the USAM. <laughs> 
I, I was. I, I'm just I, kidding. I, no, no. I, I it, it's fair. I, I, I actually thought about that. There, there were numerous times where I was like, oh, "Have man. I seen enough of the BMW covers this week? I should probably check in just to see how Smiley sounds." And you sounded great. You know, I was like, "I just checking in on my guy." <laughs> <laughs> All right, he's doing great. Okay, great. Let me flip back just, over to the tour event. You know? I'm just giving you some shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it was, uh, it was. That's right. Someone was assigned to do it. Although I really didn't even do that. Uh, all that well because as as we've documented, I mean, I can just give you my my golf week report right now if if you'd like me to to launch into that. Um, so Pine Valley on Wednesday. So here here are my big headlines from Pine Valley on Wednesday. Um, didn't did, I? I played pretty good. On the front, made a birdie at Hell's Half Acre. That was pretty nice. I, I went. I never like, played there, so I, I really have no. I've I've like Googled Pine Valley. I I know nothing besides that it's apparently great. It, good for the, you. You know, good for you. Go from going from Cypress Point to Pine Valley to Deep Dell. You sob. You forgot. Di- you forgot Diamond <laughs> Creek. You forgot JT Diamond Creek. Par- of course, yeah. Pardon me. I've been playing golf. <laughs> Uh, it feels like forever, and you're sitting here. You're just you know touching the top 100 golf courses. You know, good for you. Although I'm exhausted. Like I, 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 you know, listen, I know the world's smallest violin playing right now, but I was supposed to play in a tournament next week. And I'm like, I just need a week off. This is just, this is a lot, a lot of golf on in one short stretch of time. Um, but, uh, I had an amazing club sandwich. In fact, I had two of them mm. at Pine Valley <laughs> and I was like, damn smile. It was, uh, just perfectly toasted white bread, mm. some like bacon that was like, it was like a robust piece of bacon, like, but not, it wasn't soggy and it wasn't overly crisp. It was just like this, it was almost like did candied you, bacon. Did you take the middle layer of bread out? Cause that's like the most important thing for a club sandwich. I know that's like a part of it being a club sandwich, but I think you always got to get the middle layer of bread out. You, you know, we did, we, they didn't even serve with the middle layer of bread. Oh, Maybe perfect. Well, very, they serve yeah. it the right way then. Good. It's exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we, uh, I, I, I missed, missed dinner on Tuesday night because my flight got delayed because I, I was sitting on the runway in RDU and I got a severe thunderstorm warning, 80 mile per hour wind alert. Our yeah. That was crazy shaking. weather that week. Uh, we, we got, we caught weird. a piece of that in Birmingham too. It's been a weird weather summer, just weird weather summer. Weird yeah. as in like terribly hot and I wanted to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Please make a stop as soon as possible. Yeah. Like the, the, the mountain golf was like, Oh wait, yeah. You can like play golf in tolerable weather. That's the thing you can do. Um, so, it's so I'm very, hot next week too. It's going to uh, be like upper nineties, low hundreds, but you bet your, you bet your butt. I'm going to be out there playing some golf. I love that. I love that for you. Yeah. They, see, you're getting back on the swing of things as I'm ending. Um, I will say, um, so good club sandwiches there. I wanted to tell you, I, I had what I thought was good shower pressure at the cabin of Pine Valley and then went to deep Dale and like, <laughs> I took Dude, two you need deep goggles in there, man. Like it's, it's a hurricane. <laughs> I thought I was. I like braced myself on the walls. Like I, I thought I was gonna get like washed down the drain. You need Unbelievable. A poncho. You need, like honestly, an umbrella wouldn't hurt in there as well. Like it's, it's insane. It's a, uh, uh, yeah. It's a good little locker room setting though. Just, just, uh, just dudes being dudes. <laughs> just, just guys being dudes. Uh, a lot, a lot of good history up on the walls in there. Um, nice to see Coonan. Uh, my boy David Coonan. I saw, I saw David Coonan uh, in the pro shop. Yeah, I had I had a couple of nice little run-ins. David Coonan, Stuart Hagestad. You know, it was a good little. It, it was a there's a good little crew out there at Deep Dale. They, they, Is my they, course record uh, still still out there of shooting like I feel like I shot like 98 that day. I played out there the other day. That was the 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 day I played in the glasses. So. Yeah, that's. I was gonna say they, did they that have, hold up to 98. In the locker hold room, up? they have they have course record, <laughs> and then beneath it they have course record in glasses, and then they have your name up there. <laughs> And 109. It, yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't I couldn't hit the ball that day. It was a mess. <laughs> that course, I mean, that course will beat you up. Like the, the funny, I mean, the, the funny and sad thing about it is like I'm no in no way suited to be playing courses like Pine Valley or Deepdale on a regular basis because they're like so tight. I'm hitting the ball all over the yard off the tee. And it it's just, you know, and and but but the greens were, I mean, like like the bent grass there. And the bent grass greens at Diamond Creek. Mm. I mean, I, 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 it, 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 I mean, the bent grass greens at Pine Valley too. But it, like after playing on on Bermuda, you know, all summer long, and then getting like three courses in a row with like primo bent grass, you're like, golly, this is such a good putting surface. I'm just so excited for the fall. Like, just so not good. even whatever, whenever the fall, meaning like whenever the weather finally just give me a morning that's in the 60s, just, just. Let me wake up, go outside and drink coffee. 
and just be a little chilly. That yes. is that is peak where I need to be right now. That's where my all head's at. College game days on my mind. Yeah, getting the green egg going, all of that, and that's that's walk my outside next at month. night. You, you can you can smell someone with, with the fire going. Oh. You know, a little that little kind of fireplace smell in the air. Mm. Yeah, I'm I'm ready for it. I'm ready for it. It couldn't come fast enough. And fall golf is an exquisite time of the year. Although, yeah, I mean, I'm just gonna be watching on the sidelines. We're we're gonna flip. I'm gonna get spinal surgery. I'm just gonna be sitting around just like you know, a kid inside looking at all his friends having fun outside the window. It's gonna be a real bummer. I don't know. You've um, you've you've gone pretty hard this summer uh with yeah. the golf. So <laughs> you need to stay home. I feel I, like I get a ticket with time. I feel off. like I, from another dude to another, like, hey, you need you need to be on at home this weekend and be a dad. <laughs> That's uh my <laughs> wife was uh not so subtly just like, hey, I've been you've been on the road for like three weeks now and like I've just been caring for your child. Like let's let's chip in a little bit around here i was like fair fair i'm back i'm all the way back uh to fatherhood um but yeah that that's that's the that's, kind of report but I honey my handicap there. went down point two i mean <laughs> <laughs> she got we had oh golly there was one night where no this is pine valley yeah oh my gosh i didn't even tell you like so we lost our power that night we lost our power that night so so i'm at pine valley and oh, she's like she's like we don't have power here we have a little 10 month old home and the dogs they didn't have power the whole next day. So they had to go over and stay at a friend's house. So I, I flew home from Pine Valley that night and I had to stay at an airport hotel with my dogs and my wife because we didn't oh, have any God. power. So she was like, what hotel takes dogs? Like what hotel uh, did you get th- to? There are a couple. There were, I think it was, uh, golly. <laughs> how, did the, how did the dogs do in there? That's a better question. They, uh, they're nuts. I mean, like they, like every little sound that, uh, Nora, her little pit bull heard, she would start barking and wake up the baby. It was just, you know, it was about a, as much of a mess as you could have expected. But, um, she was like, I called her from the airport and I was like, you know, Hey, how's everything going? You know, just, you know, like, are, what are we going to do tonight? We have the hotel end up. And like, I got, you know, got into the conversation. She's like, thank you for not immediately telling me hole by hole, how you ran. I went to Pine Valley. <laughs> I was like, I can read the room. I can read the room to that degree, Amanda. Like, don't worry. I wasn't, I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to put you in that position. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's time to be a dad. It's time to kind of relax a little bit, do a little bit of rehabilitation. Um, and I'm looking forward to that. But I mean, I'm I, I'm gonna get the itch and back out playing a couple of days again. It's just love this to is hear golf. it. This is golf. Love to hear it. Um, well, that's what we got. I mean, we, we feel like we've co- we pretty much covered every which angle. I mean, we're you know we're we got the tour championship coming up this week, and and you know Scotty and Vic starting one and two at ten under and eight under. Rory and Rom in the penultimate two, some at seven under and six under. Um, Are we gonna dive into the tour championship format? How just dumb it is. Like I, I'm over this like. We can if you'd like. I, no, just just a quick thought. It's more of just like Please. I think it's dumb. You know, like uh, do you have do you have an do you, would you propose another scenario? I'm just I don't know. I'm just kind of over East Lake. I know they're about to do a renovation. It just yeah, it, nothing really gets me crazy excited about watching East Lake or the Tour Championship. I don't I don't know what it is. The guys love playing there. I just don't love watching it. And I I would rather go around a little bit more. I know totally. Agree. You know I know. Atlanta is, you know, just kind of been a staple for the tour championship and getting there. I don't know. I just something we need something different for that final final event, whether it just be stroke play and, and none of this, like just keeping that same standard deal. Um, well, we tried that. Nobody really liked that either. But I know the match play thing, you know, that's been floated as an idea to me. Like, I think you could potentially do that. And the fact that maybe have your top four guys, you know, have double buys in match play. It doesn't do really do great for TV. And the fact that you only have a couple guys come the weekend, which is when you want everybody to be out there. But still, I think match play brings a juice. Like I just being out at the USAM this week, there's just match play is the best. It, it's, it really it's, is. It's the best. And I, I think it's, you gotta, it, whichever, you know, format you you choose it's going to present other things that are that are bad about it so okay so let's take this one by one let's start with venues right uh, I, I agree with you and i think the pushback to, to you know, even as a guy who loves donald ross courses like east like like every single year it's like we, we could stand to see something a little bit different some new scenery but the pushback is always well they have like that east lake foundation where they do so much good for you know, Atlanta and, 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 you know, they raise a ton of money for charity. So how can we go away from that? So here's, here's my proposal there is in the same way that 
the BCS playoffs went to a system where they rotated which venue was hosting the final thing. Yeah, like, let's like, just, yeah, let's do get that. A couple, let's do get a couple courses in the mix. So whether it is if it is um like you know, Chicago TBC South this went, week would be yeah. so sick. Like Memphis right. being it would be totally fine to just me as well. Like, it doesn't bother me. Maybe throw maybe throw in like maybe extend it out to like the last you know the the two events before the playoffs too. You know, like, you know, if it's like, cause like Sedgefield now, like the Wyndham has like real juice is like the playing event. So if you're mixing up those venues and, and you're still hosting tournaments that mean something and raising money for charity, maybe not at the scale that you would for a tour championship, but that would be my thought on venue is let's just kind of rotate the venues around. So you're seeing something different for that last event of the year, the last few events of the year, every year. And it's something that's a little unique wrinkle. Um, in terms of format, I, I yeah, I I think match play would be, and I I think if you, if you look at, like think about all like the original matches between like Phil and Tiger and stuff like that, they found a way to make that a compelling product and sell ads against it for TV. Now I know the on site product is maybe a little bit different, but do I something. No, they're all watching this. It's the issue is the hospitality. That's right. the real issue. It's like the you donor, sell all this yeah, hospitality. Yeah, yeah. You know, like hey, we we sell you the fourteenth hole. You you get all these groups that come through. And if you only have one group that comes through that day, it's like, well, you know, like, well, what's it, the point, you know, right. Am I gonna donate <laughs> and that's money where they the make, charity? Yeah. that's where they make a lot of money is on hospitality. So that's in my head, that's why that's where the pushback would be. And yeah, I just, I don't know. I, I think match play would be sick. You judge the entire year based on stroke play, but, um, I, I don't mind a revolve. I don't, it's not that I don't, I don't, East Lake's fine. I just, yeah. Wouldn't it would be cool to see it at different venues rotating, kind of like you said? That's a good point. Yeah, yeah, and and I think too, it's like for anyone that wants to say like, oh, it's a it's a whole year of stroke play, and now you do something that's different for the last tournament. It's like, well, that's what we're doing right now anyway. We're, we're giving Scotty, <laughs> we're a changing, ten, you know, we're, we're giving Scotty yeah. a ten shot head lead or a ten shot head start. How is that? That that's not like some like if anything, match play is more ingrained in the fabric of competitive golf over the years than a. 10 shot head start is. So I don't know. I, 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 I could go both ways on it. Like, I think it makes it a cleaner viewing experience, but I also think that there's a way you could do it. That would, you know, yeah. Like give those guys a buy in the first few rounds. It just, yeah, you, you got to figure out all the back end business ports, parts of it, of the way you get the whole thing paid for, which is, you know, yeah, it's a tricky, big part so. of it right now though. You know, that's yeah. it's a huge component, but yeah, that just sorry I had to get that off my chest. It's no, like to watch this this uh, <laughs> structured scoring they have for the tour championship that just kind of bugs the crap out of me. It's perfect. Those are good final thoughts. And um, so yeah, so we launch into the final week of, of the PGA Tour regular season, and we and then we're gonna have some Ryder Cup roster reveals on the back end of that. So lots to get to ahead of uh, ahead of uh, this week. So and hopefully um, a live show. Is are we doing that? Is that a thing? What did you decide on? I'm is it possible? It, I, I yeah. Let is me that Monday? Because it comes out let, Monday. Let me check with my team, which is I'll just get offline and then go see if I can actually pull this thing off. Uh, <laughs> but if I tell you what, if I if I can make it happen, I'm definitely down for a live like show. right when they announce the thing. Like just go straight to YouTube and uh, and just get a straight full back breakdown. I love right? that. I don't know. We'll figure. I out. like that. Look at this. We're doing on air production meetings. My favorite. Um, <laughs> yeah. Let's um. Let's say. We'll, 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 we'll say thank you for listening and we'll say, we'll be back here with an interview on Thursday and we might be here. We might not be here. We'll be on YouTube. So go subscribe right now to at the smiley show on YouTube for a potential live show reacting to the selection of the Ryder cup team. Yeah. And RIP to me as well. I'm taking a red eye tonight at one o'clock in the morning from Denver to, to Atlanta. It's a two and a half hour flight, which is potentially the worst red eye situation I've ever been a part of. So, uh, thoughts and prayers to myself. Two and a half hour flight. Why is that a bad red eye situation? Because you don't even get to sleep. Like you, oh, you sleep. Oh yeah. If yeah, you don't yeah. get like a better That's red a eye situation point. would be if you're sleeping. You know, if the flight's five hours, so it's like all right, I can at least sneak in three or four hours. Two and a half hours. I mean. That's that's nothing, you know. Like that's a little cat nap. That's like going to take a pee in the middle of the night. Like it's it's not enough. Yes, thoughts and prayers to you, of course. Thoughts and prayers to me as I dry out from my south side bath that I took this weekend. And uh, we will see you here on uh, Thursday for our next episode of Smiley Show. Yes, sir.